Heavenly Father, it's in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we call upon your name this morning. We come into your house here this day to worship Jesus, uh, the name that is above every name in the universe, in heaven and in earth and under the earth, uh, the name uh, whereby we are able to find forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life and all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can come to you this morning through the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has loved us and died, us, died for us with an everlasting love, and the one who bids everyone to come. Uh, Lord, we uh, bow our hearts this morning. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for another day of your grace. Uh, we thank you that we can unite our hearts in prayer and gather as a church family. And we pray, Lord, that you would meet us where we're at this morning. Uh, if we're really struggling and in the valley, we, we pray that you would lift us up. And Lord, if we're on the mountaintop, may we bask in that. Uh, but we, may we never think of ourselves as more highly than we ought. Uh, we ask and pray, Lord, that you would encourage each heart that is here this day that you would bless us as we sing and pray and hear your word. We pray that uh, you would stir our hearts to dig deeper, uh, to have more endurance, to stay focused, uh, to seek your face. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you're here today to meet, you, meet each and every one of us and to impart blessings untold. And we pray that that would happen this hour, this day. Uh, give us the grace to sense your presence, uh, to see you this morning, high and exalted and lifted up. Father, also uh, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to lift up Mike and Carol before your throne of grace. And uh, Heavenly Father, uh, I, I pray that you would restore to Mike uh, what you've restored to Liz Gillette when she had her stroke. I pray for full mobility in the days ahead. Uh, I know, Lord, he's really struggling, but I pray that you would encourage his heart each and every day that he would look to you, that he would find great, great strength to dig down uh, and, and to work hard in his rehab. Uh, trusting, Lord, uh, that you would bless him to that end. Uh, we also pray that you would continue to give Carol great, great peace, as you have. And so we lift them up uh, before you. Uh, also, Lord, too, for the, the many that are listed on the back of our bulletin, uh, Lord, I wouldn't be able to, to recount them all, but you know each and every person that's listed, you know all of their, uh, their situations completely more so than I do. Uh, you know every thought, every struggle, every trial, uh, every victory. And I pray that uh, you would bless their hearts this day. Also, Father, too, uh, think of Sandy Sherman. Uh, lift her up today. Think of Gil. Uh, bless Gil. Uh, bless Sandy. And uh, fill their hearts with great, great joy. Thank you for their, uh, their faithfulness to this fellowship and to this church family. Father, also, too, I uh, want to lift up our country. Uh, Lord, our country greatly needs you uh, more than ever before. Uh, we lift up this election, and we ask that your will would be done. We pray uh, that you would go before each and every heart, uh, that people would seek peace, that they would seek uh, social rest, that they would seek your face. We, we pray, Heavenly Father, for the election that your will would be done. And we lift up our family. May we see a great, 
great uh, turning to you in these days because, Lord, we, uh, we're very, very concerned about our country. Also, Father, too, I lift up the surrounding churches uh, for those that exalt Christ and preach his word. I ask for power in the pulpits today uh, that you would uh, bless those pastors that uh, serve you, that preach your word, uh, that love you, that seek your face. I pray that uh, hearts would be set on fire and the message of the gospel would go forth in the communities. Again, we thank you for your presence and we thank you for this time. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we have a scripture reading, Dave. Before today's first scripture reading, if I could have Pastor and Mrs. Nabick join me up here. I saw the look of fear. <laughs> the magic number is 11,082. I had the feeling when I came up with this magic number that Mrs. Napick might know what that represents. Do you have? It was like weeks that we were here or something. <laughs> I knew, I knew I should have made it a different number. 11, I, I, I know it's not an average because it's more, right? Right. <laughs> 11,082 represent the number of days since Pastor Jerry's first official sermon here on July 1st of 1990. As my dad always said of his marriage of 65 years, and they said it wouldn't last. <laughs> But we bless you. We are blessed by you. We have from the congregation letters of appreciation for you and your beautiful wife. We also have a small token. We, we were going to do this during Pastor Appreciation Month, but there were weddings and there were all sorts of vacations and <laughs> We decided not to give it to Jim Malcolm as because he only had it. <laughs> so, since your name is on the top of it, we decided. No, seriously, you know, I am blessed uh, by having you as my pastor. Uh, I was not here on July 1st of 1990. I believe there were some people in the congregation who were. They can speak much more eloquently than I about what you meant to this congregation. But for each and every one of us in the congregation, I know, as I glance out at them, I know that each and every one of them has been blessed by, you, by both of you and your pastor here at First Baptist. This is for you, Steve. And we know, and we know that although he is a man of many words around 1130 or so, he is a man of few words. <coughs> So we asked Mrs. Napper if she has anything to say, because we know that Mr. Napper. I, I have. I do have a oh. couple of things. Thank you for not giving this to Jim. Not only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I gave her the bag because it's all about image, right? <laughs> That's, God bless you, folks. We love you, and uh, thank you very much. And what are your plans for next October? <laughs> you know. Don't know yet. <laughs> okay. God bless. <laughs> when Helen asked if I would present the Napix with the cards and gift, you know, I was of course honored, and it it dawned on me uh, <clears throat> as I looked out and thought about it that each and every member of the congregation that I could think of has had a personal experience with the NAPIC. And to me, that speaks volumes about the world we live in today and about the church that we attend. 
So I again thank you from the bottom of my heart. This morning's first scripture reading is from the book of Hebrews, from the second chapter of the book of Hebrews. I'll be reading verses 9 through 18. And if you're using a red church Bible, that can be found on page 1162. The second chapter of Hebrews, verses 9 through the end of the chapter. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Uh, second scripture reading is from Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Nick and Tiffany brought Nathan over last, uh, early last evening to get some candy. They were all dressed up. Nick, Nick was a scarecrow. Uh, Tiffany was kind of like Mrs. Scarecrow. And what was Nathan? This is a farmer. A farmer. A farmer. And uh, he wanted to see the chickens, right? And they went over to the chickens, and when the rooster crowed, he was like, he broke out in tears. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, maybe he should stick with being a scarecrow or something. Uh, let's, let's pray. All right. Now, Heavenly Father, um, what you have used, uh, what you have laid upon my heart, use uh, this morning uh, in all of our hearts, and I pray in Jesus' name, Amen. <coughs> So you've heard of uh, Luciano uh, Pavarotti. Um, he's been deceased for, I don't know, maybe 13 years or 14 years now. But um, he once said, when I was a boy, my father, a baker, introduced me to the wonders of song. He urged me to work hard to develop my voice. Origio Pola a professional tenor in my hometown of Modena, Italy, took me as a pupil. I also enrolled in a teacher's college. On graduating, I asked my father, shall I be a teacher or a singer? Luciano, my father replied, if you try to sit on two chairs, you will fall between them. For life, you must choose one chair. I chose one 
It took seven years of study and frustration before I made my first professional appearance. It took another seven to reach the Metropolitan Opera. And now I think whether it's laying bricks, writing a book, whatever we choose, we should give ourselves to it. Commitment, that's the key. Choose one chair. Now, most of us, if not all of us, have fallen off a chair, right? Who, has, who here has not ever fallen off of a chair? Okay, so we can all relate, right? But have you ever fallen between two chairs? Anybody? Who's fallen between two chairs? I've, I've never fallen between two chairs, okay? Um, never missed two, uh, but lately, I feel as though I'm falling between two chairs, and maybe perhaps you can relate. Uh, election day is just two days away, and I feel as though I'm falling between two chairs. Now, I don't want you to interpret this as me struggling to choose between who to vote for. Uh, I don't have that problem. I know who I'm voting for. When I refer to falling between two chairs, I mean one chair is the kingdom of God, which is heavenly and spiritual, and the other chair is the kingdom of men, which is earthly and political. And that's what I mean by struggling and feeling like I'm falling between two chairs. I, I, I think of the words of Jesus, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now, if you take a look at that in context, it's about money and whether you know, you're supposed to support and taxes and whether you're supposed to support the temple. But the principle that comes out of that still applies. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God's the things that are God's. There's a heavenly realm that we all strive for. There is a political realm that we, and an earthly realm that we live in. Uh, we're in the world, we're not of it, right? As John said in his gospel. And so I don't know about you, but I, I have a sense, because I've talked to some people, I am actually probably certain that many of you are dealing with the same concerns, emotions, anxieties, and anticipation for what happens two days from now. I mean, after all, it's our country, right? Why? Why are you concerned? Why am I concerned? Because as they say, elections have consequences, right? They do. I have talked to numerous believers there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of fears, a lot of concerns that have been dominating for weeks. And I know, because I felt it as well. And momentarily throughout each day, when I think about it, I feel it. And so what we have is the seesaw effect, emotionally. Up and down, up and down, you know? Remember when you were a kid and you were on the seesaw? It was fun, right? until you slammed on the bottom. And it's like, ow, that hurts, right? I don't want the emotional seesaw effect, and I'm sure you don't as well. And, and, and so what I can relate to personally is that when I stop and pause, I'm reminded that God's got this, amen? After the election on Tuesday, God will still be in control of the universe. He will still be in control of all things. Amen. Praise God. Thank God for that. As the scripture says, he's king of kings and lord of lords. He raises up leaders. He brings them down. He thwarts their purposes. He establishes them in righteousness and justice, if that's his desire. And so... This is why I thought it would be great to try to focus this morning, or maybe refocus. I want to stop the seesaw effect. I don't want to fall between two chairs. That's kind of uncomfortable. And I think it's a very, very timely message. I know I need to stay focused. I know that you need to stay focused. There are many, many distractions in the kingdom of men, right? What we have uh, the virus 
right? Uh, which I believe has been overblown. Uh, read the story about Jack Nicholas the other day. 80, he and his wife got it. They took hydroxychloroquine. They were fine two days later, right? The economy, which the virus has blown up, the rioting, an occasion for chaos and social unrest to present a political narrative. It's all for political opportunity. That's my personal belief. And I believe that if you do some research and digging, you can probably find that to be quite true. I mean, back in 1968, we had a Hong Kong virus. Four million people died. Did we shut the entire economy of the world down? No. The kingdom of men and many, many distractions. Now, I don't want you to interpret this that I'm suggesting that we should not be concerned about what happens. Uh, this is where we live. This is America. I think we should be very, very concerned. Uh, this is not normal times, right? And I pray, as you do, that this too shall pass. I'm also not suggesting that we should be apolitical and not involved. When we talk about the distractions of the kingdom of men and, you know, uh, the kingdom of heaven, we live in both realms. And we have to negotiate it. And so I would encourage everyone to be all involved fiscally and politically at a level to, you, to the point where you know what your elected officials are doing or what they're not doing. One of the reasons why you have runaway politicians today and we have what we have today is because we've gotten so busy and we look inward and we forget that these people are accountable to the people. We should be concerned about the rule of law and those who are elected to political office to lead us. We should be involved. If you can't physically be involved, you should at least intellectually be involved and know what's going on. You should try to sort through the deception and the distractions and the, the magical acts. You know, as the magician's doing this right here, look at what's going on over here. And we should all vote. I'm a big proponent in that. I vote every year, every, every election. What I am suggesting is this, though. We're citizens of heaven first, amen? My allegiance is to America. My higher allegiance is to God Almighty, and so is yours. We're citizens of heaven first. And I think all of us should be concerned about the amount of oil that we have in our lamps. You know the parable of the virgin, Matthew 25, right? The virgins, right? Some didn't have oil. They were running around last minute looking, looking for the oil. I don't want low oil. I don't want no oil. I want to have a lot of oil. Because I can see what's coming, and I think that you can too. And hopefully, we have enough oil where we don't cave and we walk away and, and prone to leave the God who has called us. Now, this would be a good time because when I was with you several weeks back before I went on vacation, I mentioned in my message about, at times, not wanting to be a believer anymore. I never had that in my notes. That just kind of came out. But I want to clarify that. Because I was talking to my wife about it, I talked to Harold about it, uh, Chuck about it, some other people about it. And what I meant is to say, spiritual ignorance is bliss. Right? Ignorance is bliss. When you're not a believer, you can easily sit in the chair of the kingdom of men. The ways of the world are normal. There's little to no conflict. There's little resistance. Truth is often suppressed. And one's conscience can be easily dismissed and suppressed. And you don't come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But if you're a believer, it's the antithesis of all that. 
The conviction of the Holy Spirit brings light and truth to light. We move, when we move from darkness to light and we become a believer, you start to understand that some people aren't going to heaven. I mean, and, you know, and, and that they're going to hell forever. And so you become a man of sorrows or a woman of sorrows because you start to see the world as it really is, right? When you become a believer, there's, there's great conflict and friction and resistance. Because you're presented with another seat at the table, right? You sit at the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you're a citizen of heaven. One would be a fool to trade their salvation like Esau did for a bowl of soup. I always read that passage and I think, good Lord, where was this guy at? I would never trade my salvation for a bowl of soup. And yet I have to admit, spiritual ignorance is bliss. But spiritual ignorance is not blessed. You go to Romans chapter 1. All are without excuse. The Christian and the non-Christian. Now, that's the first part of the message. I want to talk about the election and the candidates and the platforms before I get to the text. So this election is about the next four years. Uh, but remember, it's ultimately about the kingdom of men. Amen? It's about the kingdom of men. America is an idea. It's a great idea. It's a blessed idea. It's the greatest place to live on the planet Earth. But I submit to you that it's worldly, and it's of this world. America, I wish I could say this, but America will not last forever. It's an idea. The kingdom of God is scriptural and through and through. That will be the kingdom that lasts forever. And that's why we need to focus on that kingdom. And truth be told, our country has lost that focus a long, long time ago. It was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. It was founded on scripture. And we've thrown it out. And that's why you're seeing the mess that you see today. I appreciate and cherish the Christian heritage that our country has. That I was raised with. I praise God I heard about Christ as I was raised. I pray for Christian influence in our communities. And for our leaders. As I'm sure you do too. And so I would say to you, participate as an American citizen. It's your right to do so. But vote as a citizen of heaven. Because when you vote as a citizen of heaven, God's favor will be more and more upon this land. We forget that. We, we look for a savior in all the wrong places. Government is not the savior. Government, this, this government was never founded to be the be-all and the end-all. God was to be that. The other thing I want to say is this. Because we live in such politically charged atmosphere in an election, I pray that you would stay away from the political crowds after election day. Stay away. Because there are groups that are looking for a physical fight. I just saw this morning, before I had a time of prayer, Trump's supporter was beat up in Beverly Hills just for attending a rally. Some, people, some groups are looking for a fight. Maybe some Trump groups are looking for a fight, I don't know. Seems to be primarily on the left, but that's my understanding. Stay away from the crowds, especially 
if the election hasn't been decided by Tuesday. Because I think that some of the voting is going with some states into the following week, week which is absolute insanity. You want chaos? You want conflict? You want confusion? Embrace policies like It's just absolutely ins insane. It's like a banana republic. Your safety is most important. I remember years ago when I first became a Christian, I was in a prayer meeting one evening, and this dear saint talked about how it was after the Tiananmen Square massacre, and he talked about how people will die for an idea. It's true. Don't die for an idea that's not going to last. You can be principled, but your safety and your family come first. The other thing I want to say uh, before I get to the text. This election and every election is about choosing one system over the other. One is primarily what our founding fathers had put in place based on Judeo-Christian values, as I said a little bit earlier. The other is socialistic, what our founding fathers did not put in place. And it's not based on Judeo-Christian values. And when you take a look at the actual policies of the two major parties, and let me break it down for you, because I try to stay politically astute. That's sometimes why I fall between two chairs. But the policies on the left are baseless and godless. They're not based on scripture. It's based on confusion and chaos and a wisdom of this world. And that's why you see the insanity out there. And yet, yet many policies on the right are more in line with Scripture, but not all of them. Not all of them at all. I mean, look at some of the platform in the parties. Uh, we gave you 15 points this morning, but there's probably another 150 points. And you know, as they say, the devil's in the details, right? Many see the choices today as the lesser of two evils. And while no system is perfect, I would suggest to you that one system, some systems are better than another. One comes from the founding fathers. It's based on Judeo-Christian values. It's closer to a biblical framework. It's generally more conservative and traditional. It's about individual choice to choose. And it has produced the greatest country and the greatest society in all of human history. Amen? So what do you have today? The greatest society and country in all of human history because of how the country was founded. The other system comes from Karl Marx. It's about the power of the state, not the power of the individual. It's contrary to scripture and biblical frameworks. It's liberal and generally anything goes against scripture. It's about the state exercising control ultimately over your choices. I want to make my own choices. I don't want the state or anyone else to make them for me. Unless I'm incapacitated and my wife and children can make them together. I want to decide what I do with my money whether I give it to a charity or I give it to something else. Look at where socialism has failed throughout the world. You know, I was talking to my brother about this, you know, he works with a bunch of socialists. And they say, well, socialism has worked in some countries. And he's got a great response. Take a look at the Scandinavian countries, they're all very small. It might work in small countries, it's not going to work in a big country. Socialism will collapse this entire system. I'm not, I'm not a mathematician, I didn't do great at math. But I'll tell you what, I add, up, I add up the math of the Green New Deal and all these crazy ideas. Bankruptcy to the, to the 10th power. It's not going to work. Uh, what did Ronald Reagan say? The problem with socialism is economic misery for all. 
It's what it is. And I remind you about Daniel chapter 2. Remember, remember the image, not the image, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had that Daniel interpreted? A big stone was coming out of heaven and it smashed all the kingdoms of, the, of men, all the kingdoms of the world. Oh, I love that. God's going to have the final say and he's victorious. Going back to the policies of the left and the right, because some are more biblical than others, but even on the right, some of the policies aren't biblical. God has a plumb line. It ain't moving left or right. And that standard is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not moving. It's not moving at all, folks. Won't move for me, won't move for you, didn't move for Moses. Didn't move for the Apostle Paul or any of the saints. And so it, it begs the question, what kind of people are we going to be? Are we going to be citizens of heaven f focused on the kingdom of heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are we going to be citizens of the earth and focused here? I think they're, they're great questions. Maybe that's what's wrong with the church today. Not this church, but the church at large. You know, falling between two chairs, or maybe sitting in the one chair, the kingdom of men. Now to the text. Finally to the text. If you take a look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, this tells us what we need to do to stay focused. And if you take a look at verse 1, it reminds us that there's a great cloud of witnesses, and that is referring back to Hebrews chapter 11. And these were average people. They were great saints. They had great faith. They had great hope. They had great vision. They had great passion to obey God and to do the right thing. And that's why they're listed here. Now, this isn't this isn't a, um, a comprehensive list, but it's what the Holy Spirit chose to put into the text of Scripture. And they're great and wonderful examples. And I would submit to you that they negotiated the two chairs, the choice between two chairs. Uh, they weren't perfect. They failed often. They faltered miserably at times. I mean, take a look at Samson. Goodness, Samson, Jethro, Gideon, I mean, they all, even Abraham, Moses, they all faltered. But they stayed the course. And I was reflecting on this, I looked at some of these names, and I would submit to you that they all lived during treacherous and difficult and hard, very, very hard times. They lived in the kingdom of men. They are singled out here for what they did or what they did not do, and they're wonderful, wonderful examples of choosing the right chair, the kingdom of God. Now, I said to you that this passage tells us how to stay focused. Uh, the right chair, choosing the right chair, starts with getting rid of of or overcoming spiritual obstacles because that's what it says in verse 1. Uh, let us lay aside every encumbrance, every obstacle, uh, every, and the NIV has everything that hinders. It could be um, the same obstacles or different obstacles. It doesn't mean we're all different, right? But getting rid of or overcoming the spiritual obstacles that are in our way. Uh, literally, the Greek means, get this, it's a tumor or a mass, a magnitude, a weight, or a burden, something that's an impediment. I, can you imagine trying to run with a 25-pound tumor, like hanging off your side? Or, you know, a 50-pound weight on your back? And, and so the idea here is to be burden-free. Run in such a way where you're burden-free. And as I look at the cross... It's such a sketch. I've said this before. 
burden-free. Try not to bring all the garbage and all the stuff back, all the failings and all the falterings. Etch a sketch, burden-free. Are there burdens that weigh us down today and keep us from running? I think that's a great question. It's also about getting rid of the sin. Now, I want to say this because this is the Lord Jesus Christ's department to get rid of the sin. But as you read scripture, we have a role too, right? We have to say, God, God, please operate on me. Get rid of this tumor, will you please? Uh, this has been interpreted um, I know by Charles Stanley, um, as the sin, the one sin that trips you and me up. And what your sin is, my sin may not be. And what my sin is, someone else's may not be. But it's the one sin. You keep on stumbling and stumbling and stumbling. Uh, the idea here is that we can run without getting tripped up. And take a look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It tells us how to get rid of the weights and the sin. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We focus on Him. We've all taken our eyes off the Lord, haven't we? Every single one of us. Every single saint has done that. Even Moses did that. It's part of being human. It's part of the spiritual journey. But I look at this verse, and the beauty of it reminds us how to run. And, and you know, you can't run if you're looking back, right? You can't run if you're casually glancing at everything else. It requires focus. You know, um, I hate running. Who loves, Heidi, you love running. Heidi loves running. I hate running. <clears throat> I, I, Heidi, I will never run with you. I hate running. I can't stand running. I said, I mean, you know, my nephew, he loves to run like Heidi. He says, oh, I love the breeze in my face. I love the breeze when the wind blows. I hate running. <laughs> but you know something? I'm always intrigued by the Boston Marathon. These people that get out there in their shorts in April... And they just run. And then you got the Heartbreak Hotel, you know, not the Heartbreak Hotel, the Heartbreak Hill, right? It might be a hotel for some when they're done, right? But um, always been intrigued by it. Maybe you've seen the photos. How many line up? Thousands, thousands line up. How many finish? Not many. Some do it in a little two hour, over two hours. I think it's over two hours still, right, Dave? I don't think they're under two hours yet with running the marathon. Some do it in a little over two hours. Some do it in eight or nine hours. Wow, what endurance, right? But they finish. And that's what it's all about, right? Finishing. It's being fixated. It's not a casual glance. It's keeping Christ in view, front and center. And he's able to help you and me with that fixation. I want to be fixated on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to look away, and yet I do it so often. I think you, I think you know what that's about, too. Listen to First Thessalonians 5, verse 24. Faithful is he who calls us, and he will do it. He will help us be fixated on him. That's why he went to Calvary. Take a look very quickly at... I have no clock up here. The battery's dead. That's really dangerous. The latter part of Hebrews chapter 12, I'm sorry, uh, latter part of Hebrews uh, verses 2 and 3. Hebrews 12 verses 2 and 3, the latter part. I want you to notice, we talk about how to run. It points us to Christ himself. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3 reminds us that Jesus is the ultimate example. All those people in Hebrews 11, wonderful examples. But Christ is the ultimate example. Because it reminds us of his cross. He endured it. He despised the shame. He endured the hostility in the sinners. And guess what? And then he sat down. Oh, it's beautiful. Why? Is Christ the ultimate example? Because it says, so we don't grow weary and lose heart. Now, 
I don't know about you, but when I am not fixated on the kingdom of God and on Jesus, I grow tired. I grow weary. I fall between two chairs. I lose heart. Terribly, terribly so. I lose my strength. I'm talking about physical and spiritual. I don't want to do it anymore. And I would submit to you, I think you probably know what I'm talking about. Because you're human too. It's a terrible, terrible place to be. Jesus is our focus. He's our standard. He's our example. He's the way, the truth, and the life on how we negotiate the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of men. I remind you, we stand for something greater than a citizen of America. We're ambassadors of the king, citizens of heaven. What does that mean? We don't shy away from the truth. We expose it. That's what we do. We don't pe play the politically correct game. Because if I did, I wouldn't say what I said today. We're to speak the truth in love. That's an honorable and courageous and admirable thing to do. You know, when I was back in seminary many, many moons ago, I don't know how many days that would be, Dave, more than 11,000, right? We talked about what hills we're going to die on. What hills? Pick a lot of different hills in the battlefield. What hill are you going to die on? Now I'm talking figuratively. This is one of the hills I will die on, speaking God's truth. I wouldn't have it any other way. I hope that you would feel the same way. And if it's a literal hill, then so be it. You know, what's the worst that happened? I, I, I die and I go to heaven? <laughs> Come, please. I die and I go to heaven? Please. Can't get any better than that. So, may we always remember that God is in control of everything, even elections. He will have his way because God is not mocked. Hebrews 6, 7, he is not mocked. But I would encourage you all to pray for peace. Pray that God would bring any fraud to light. I think that's very, very important. Pray that the election results are accepted, whether it be whatever side, in fairness and in goodwill, when all is said and done. And above all, pray that reason and sanity prevail. That God gets rid of this insanity in this world in which we're living in. It's insane. And all the while, fix your eyes on Jesus. Continue to do so as the author and finisher of your faith. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I do mean gracious and heavenly and our Father. We pray for our country. We pray for our focus. We pray for your will to be done and we pray that you would restore law and order to this great country. We pray for a revival throughout the land, that our churches would be on fire, that the souls of the saints would be on fire, that we would speak truth, that we would have the Lord Jesus Christ front and center, that he would always be in view, knowing that he's our reward and our prize. We want to give you the praise and the honor and the glory, and we thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Folks.
our, as we prepare for communion, our communion hymn this morning is Jesus paid it all. Uh, that, in a nutshell, is the heart of the gospel. Uh, we can't work for it. We can't buy it. Uh, we can't earn it. It's grace. It's a gift. Please stand. 305, Jesus paid it all.